Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. I'm Jennifer Ablon, Editor-in-Chief of Pensions and Investments, and I'm here with Ashby Monk, Executive Director of the Stanford Research Initiative on Long-Term Investing. Ashby has more than 20 years of experience studying and advising investment organizations. He has authored multiple books and published hundreds of research papers on institutional investing. Outside of academia, Ashby is the head of research at Adapar and serves on the firm's leadership team. He has co-founded several companies that help investors make better investment decisions, including Real Capital Innovation, which was acquired by Adapar, Future Proof, Net Purpose, Data, Third Act, and Long Game Savings. Thank you so much for being here, Ashby. Hi. Happy Friday. Happy Friday, TGIF. I know. I'm excited. I need one, but I'm I'm still super pumped to talk to you. This is my first LinkedIn live. Jen. Same with I'll... me. Same with me. This is this is exciting. I think so we... because this says live, we can't mess it up. We got to get it right on the first take. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that they've kind of reinvented the radio. That's what I was thinking to myself last night. I was like, it's kind of like radio. Like you yes, accept absolutely. a much smaller audience. Right, right. So we have a lot to discuss today. So okay. let's get into your new project to modernize pension plans. I know that you have banged the table about excessive fees and cost transparency, which really stemmed from your research on sovereign wealth funds. Your new project will show how technology delivers higher performance. Break this down for us. What is the goal and mission of your new project? Well, my goal and mission is really... It hasn't changed in the 20 years that I've been studying these amazing organizations. Um, it's to improve investment decisions with the objective of delivering higher performance. So like that, like everything I do is like people are like, what do you what what do you say yes to and what do you say no to? If if the project is about improving investment performance for pension funds, I'm probably gonna say yes to it because that's the the kind of motivator of my life, whether it's working in academia or helping to start any of those companies you mentioned. It's all about delivering higher performance. And then as an additional component, trying to deliver, oh, and there's my co-author walking back there. <laughs> um, that's mega dog. Sorry about that. This is live. So uh, yeah, so I'm trying to improve investment decisions, improve investment outcomes. And then also, and this is going to sound a little bit too ambitious, perhaps improve the world. Um, because I think these investors are profoundly important. I think they're probably the most important organizations on the planet. I put a period at the end of that statement. Um, you know, they, when you take this asset owner community, you're talking about $120 trillion. It's the size of the global stock market. And they put the capital in capitalism. That's the risk capital flowing into venture funds, private equity funds, hedge they funds. They move markets. They move markets. And oh, by the way, they happen to be the like foundation of our modern social welfare state. So that's an interesting component that makes them a little bit different. People often ask me, hey, why don't you sit in a business school, your new project, SLTI? And I have to, you know, kind of explain to them that these aren't actually businesses. They, they often compound their investment performance tax-free, which doesn't sound very businessy. Um, and so thinking through how they make decisions has been a huge part of what I do and what I have been doing for 20 years. And to your question, Jen, I am going to come to your question. Technology, obviously, is going to be a massive part of that going forward. We're going to get out of the world of spreadsheets and into something a little bit more professional grade in the next five years. And how has the industry absorbed this? Um, this does sound like a huge shift um you know technology can sometimes scare people uh talk about how you've been executing this isn't it an interesting moment to be we when we decided to do this i don't think the chat gpt piece had actually really hit like it's hit in the last few weeks um so I, it's funny that like i actually sense real fear about what technology is going to do to this to this industry, but really all kind of knowledge based industries, because if you think about what chat GPT is, it's a knowledge layer it goes out into the world. You don't really know where it get its where it gets the data. In fact, a lot of their data seems wrong. I asked chat GPT about myself the other day and it said I wrote books that I never wrote and I have <laughs> I have degrees that I don't have. So, like, be careful if you're using chat GPT for anything serious. But it is this amazing knowledge layer. You can, ask a 
you know, how should I teach my first class at Stanford? It will give you a very coherent answer on like what you should do in your first class. And so that does present a little bit of a threat. Um, I think actually on just to finish the loop on that, I think the more you know about a topic, the less afraid you are that chat GPT is going to displace you. It's for that kind of introductory level knowledge that it's quite powerful. But to kind of come back to your question, I think a lot of investment organizations are spending a lot of money on technology. And so why are they doing that? What is the business value of that spend? You know, it's upwards of one basis point, which when mm -hmm. you're like, oh, one basis point doesn't sound like very much. It is if you have half a you know, trillion dollars, um, it's a big spend. And so thinking about how that technology ultimately, as we started this LinkedIn Live, enhances return is a huge part of this project that, that we're working on at Stanford right now. How does that one basis point deliver more than one basis point in value to these investment organizations? And so that's the work I'm doing now. So you uh, were quoted as saying, you know, what you're seeing in this industry today is a huge investment in technology, what you would call the portfolio GPS. And once right. you have that GPS for your portfolio, then you can start to think about how to actually go about changing where your portfolio is today. Yep. Let's, let's talk about this, elaborate on this. It seems simple to say that like investors are in the business of plotting a course into the future. You have some portfolio today. You have some set of expected contributions into your fund. You have cash and you have some future objective. And so you're going to put that portfolio to work in financial markets under the assumptions and expectations that it's going to deliver you certain risk adjusted returns and cash yields and flows. And, you know, in the distant future, you're going to get the money back out in the form of cash. That's your destination. And you're going to pay pensions. You're going to fund a university. Um, and so when we think about this kind of GPS for your portfolio, which I've been calling portfolio positioning system, um, it's really about that first part of navigation. Where are you? If you think about like the personal navigation space, um, we've really come a long way in two decades. Like if I, when I was growing up, I, I had paper maps in the car and, you know, you really did trust the person next to you that knew a shortcut, you know, this person, I'll make this left turn. I, I know this way, the lights are all timed and you're going to catch all the green lights. If you make this light, that doesn't happen anymore. I mean, at least not in my world. <clears throat> now you just look at ways. And you just look at Google Maps and Waze tells you if there's a police officer that's going to bust you for speeding and it tells you if there's a traffic jam ahead. And so ultimately, that personal navigation framework has moved from a paper based model where human experience and knowledge really matter into this data driven model where everything seems to come through your uh, mobile device and you're really trusting the mobile device and the data. There you go. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's funny, I often tell people that there's this London taxi exam that the London taxi drivers have to take. It's called the knowledge. And it's because they've gone through the process of collecting the data, um, transforming it into information and building knowledge about where to drive you when you get in their taxi. Now you don't even need that knowledge. I mean, London taxi drivers will hate it that I'm saying this, but um, you don't need that knowledge anymore. It's on your phone. And it, it all started with GPS. And, you know, in the initial phase of GPS, I remember giving my dad a GPS device in the 90s. And he was like, this is neato. What do I do with it? And I'm like, well, it tells you where you are. Isn't that cool? And he's like, I know where I am. But there was nothing built on it. You know, it was just like a coordinates. And I feel like that coordinate is kind of the moment we're in right now. For, for the investment space where pension funds are out there, they're spending huge amounts of money building data pipelines to clean their data, to put it in context, to get it into a dashboard, to really drill into what are my exposures today? You know, Silicon Valley Bank blows up. People really need to know quickly, what are my exposures to banking assets? Where are my cash positions? This is all the type of stuff that a GPS for your portfolio should allow you to do almost in real time. Once you have that GPS, then you can start to think about, well, where should I go? 
Now I know, you know, that I've got these risk exposures. I have these products. I have these geographies. I have these industries. These are all the different lenses that are going to come as we get our data organized. And really, that's what we're working on right now. But once we get that in place, then you can start to do the optimizations around the future. You can define where you're going. And you can say, well, I want to optimize for liquidity or flexibility, or maybe I don't want to pay much in fees. I don't know what we want, but that's this is the logic of the investment in, in data and tech. It's about getting your portfolio in context, understanding what you own, so that you can plot much more sophisticated pathways into the future. I just want to remind the audience, we are taking questions, so please drop them in the chat. Uh, we do have a question about... Uh, you know, how will data and technology affect pension funds' reliance on external managers and consultants? How, how is it going to affect yeah, external how, managers how and consultants? How will the data and te technology affect pension funds' yeah. reliance on external managers and consultants? Well, part of me thinks that reliance may actually just shift a little bit, but won't dramatically change. So if you think about, we've had, we've gone through this process really over the last 20 years of internalization of investment decisions. You know, people hold up the Canadian model and really it was the crown corporation governance model there that allowed them to compensate people almost as if they were private sector employees. And that was a, a really empowering moment where it was like, well, maybe we don't need to pay all these external managers, all these fees in order to internalize. The technology revolution is going to be a little bit different from that kind of internalization revolution, because th the thing with technology is it's best when it's done at scale. It's best when you can pull collective intelligence around the platform, as in a lot of people, a lot of organizations are using that technology. And so that's quite a different framework from the, the obvious kind of investment strategy where people keep things very close to their chest and they kind of hide their IP for the fear of leaking their secret sauce out into the community. Technology allows you to build mass customization of portfolios that truly reflect your needs and allow you to generate collective value. You know, if you think about the power of your mobile device and getting you from A to B, it really only works because we're all on it, right? Like if only 10 of us were using Waze, like that's not a very useful device. And so that foundational component where we're all kind of um, bringing our data into the same shared platform with very strict rules on that data and how it's utilized, that shared platform becomes kind of a new ecosystem of decision-making and investing. Those shared platforms and the analytical tools that are built on them, like if you think about the current GPS for just our lives, on that you've got Uber, Lyft, Amazon, DoorDash, all these things that are truly GPS-enabled companies we're going to end up with similar things in the asset management space. But technology that needs to be built at scale is probably going to be built by independent private sector entities. You know, right now you see a lot of pension funds thinking, well, I can internalize this and do it myself. I don't think they're going to be able to do that with data and analytics. I mean, you are seeing some pension funds hiring Python engineers right. and thinking, I'm going to build my own Python toolkit in order to model unfunded commitments or something like that. But I think that's a blip. I think technology is incredibly difficult to, to maintain. So like once you build the tech, it doesn't just stop running. You know, you don't need to stop building it and improving it. So I, I know I'm, I'm kind of rambling here, Jen, but I'm just trying no, to say, I think not. it's going to shift this. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> All right. It's going to so, shift the dynamic. So you know, which institutional investors do you think currently use data and technology most efficiently? It's a good question. So um, a lot of the Australian super funds are investing heavily in their data and technology, which I think is a function of the fact that the regulator down there has said, we're going to merge a lot of these plans. And so there is this kind of existential threat like literally some of those plans are going to go away 
and they're going to survive if they get really good really fast at delivering better performance to members. And that's a, an impulse that we don't really have in American pension plans, for example, which generally have monopolies over their asset base. You know, um, CalPERS is, is never going to go away. You know, our, our friends running that organization may change, but um, the, that organization will be there. And so in that kind of a context where there isn't a threat of exit, it is hard to find motivation to spend one basis point of AUM on technology. You know, you really have to go through the process of building the business case. Whereas when you're down in Australia and you're like, well, we might go away unless we get ahead of our peers, that it's a little bit easier to convince the boards of those organizations to spend aggressively. So you see Australian Super, Aware, ART down there um, really starting to lead the charge on investment data and technology. Um, I'd also say the Dutch plans, and, and in particular APG, has been a leader on um, technology and data-driven decision-making. And, uh, and there's probably a few other leaders that are really getting their GPS in place. But I would say 99% of the organizations when it comes to plotting the future. So what are my unfunded commitments? What are my, um, what are my projected returns under different scenarios? Almost universally, you will still see a spreadsheet pulled out of somewhere. So and how do we change the behaviors of the big asset owners? How do we, how do we disrupt? How do we disrupt? Well, <laughs> we, we can disrupt a few ways. Um, we can disrupt with crises. That's always a good way to do it. That's how we've done it in the past. I'm not a huge fan of that because it comes with a lot of pain. But the good news is there's generally always a crisis inside the world of pension funds and sovereign funds endowments. You know, you mentioned when we were kicking off the show here that like I used to just go off on fees and costs and right. I used to spend a lot of time. That was ultimately because I was looking to provide um, management teams inside pension funds with ammunition to go to the board to extract resources, often to pay those same management teams more money, but to build bigger and better teams. And if you revealed how much those pension funds were paying private equity and hedge funds, not only to the board, but to the stakeholders, the board would almost be obligated to rethink how that pension fund was accessing markets because the delta between net and gross returns was often far bigger than those pensions realized. And so in that case, we used that transparency to drive changes to compensation at public pension plans, um, resourcing and headcount, all that kind of stuff. Those are different parts of the organizational capability. And I'm taking you through that because I see technology as another key part of that organizational capability. There's culture, there's governance, and there te there's technology sitting as the base layer of all these organizations. And so ultimately, when we think about getting resources to build or buy next generation technology, we need to sort of reveal the secondary and tertiary consequences of either not investing in technology, as in you're falling behind, and here are the costs that you're incurring that you're maybe not capturing in any table, or here are the benefits. That's the carrot. How much additional return can we expect to get from investing in technology? So if I'm telling you that the average pension plan is investing one basis point every year in their tech stack, I better be able to show you that they're making two basis points more. And ideally, not just a basis point, but maybe even a percentage point more as a function of those investments. That's when it becomes a true no-brainer to make these investments. So let's talk a little bit about uh, blockchain. Are you using it or encouraging its use as part of allocation among pension funds and other institutional investors? Yeah, I think the part of blockchain that is incredibly useful here, especially in, in markets that still feel like there are telephones connected to wires, like fixed income trading desks and things like that. I think blockchain is going to offer a real opportunity in that fixed income world to finally like digitize these instruments. 
I mean, I've been blown away to understand exactly how like muni bonds get sold and, 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 you know, this entire space. So I think there's a component of the blockchain world that is really going to pull this ecosystem into the modern era. I think the part that we're going to struggle with is the part that's like, oh, this is public blockchain with transparency galore. This is not an industry that does that well with complete transparency. You know, I think for now, the managers in particular would like to keep their IP locked down. And I think they see that IP as trade secret, which is a very strict definition on what you can share and not share. And that pushes the limited partners into a difficult bind, even in talking with their peers about who they own and what they're paying their peers. So, well, I think blockchain is like one of the most promising technologies to kind of emerge out of this DeFi space, far more promising than digitized uh, monkey pictures, um, which was, you know, what I think most people were talking about for a long time. Uh, it's probably, we still need to kind of define those use cases a little bit better to see where it's going to make the biggest um, inroads. But so by the way, APG, the APG uses blockchain right now to communicate, I think, to their members, the the nature of their pension. I'd have to go double check that, but I'm pretty sure. So you're saying the data and finance is very private. I am saying that. <laughs> That's correct. I don't know if you've um, noticed that. Yeah. So, you know, does this new system then compete with something like BlackRock's Aladdin? I think what I'm describing, um, oh, this is amazing. Somebody's coming in behind me. What I'm describing is, um, this is going to be hilarious because he's going to ring the doorbell. Oh, I love then, live uh, events. <laughs> oh, yeah. One second. Um, my wife is going to handle it. This is the best. Um, so Aladdin and BlackRock and SimCorp and NASDAQ and, and Adapar are all part of this tech model, right? So the key here is first and foremost to get the data into the platform. That's the GPS. And so I think. So collect, um, collecting the data. Collect the data so that you have, you, know, you don't have kind of a garbage in garbage out. You know, that's the classic phraseology here. It's, it's um, if you have good data powering these, then you're going to ultimately transform your portfolio. That's the goal, right? Is like, I want to be able to show that you bought technology and that technology changed your portfolio. That's that's when I think the unlock happens in everybody's mind. It's not that you just like automated away a role. Oh, Chad GPT is going to write my investment memos now. So I, I don't have to have as many people on staff doing due diligence. That's interesting. But I feel like if I'm honest, that feels a little bit like the Henry Ford faster horses concept. What I want is a new car and the equivalent of a new car is the new portfolio. And so when I think about that new portfolio, it's like, all right, we get the data into these systems. The one you had mentioned is one of the systems that is pervasive in the industry. There's a bunch of these different systems that are pervasive in the industry. We need to build the GPS. So we need to build all the feeds to the custodians. We need the private equity managers to allow us to extract the data from their PDFs. Um, unfortunately, that's how we still get the data from a lot of the alternatives industry. It would be amazing if somebody out there could just organize that data. Then you've got all of that real-time data flowing through into these organizations. And then you, on top of that data, you start building these analytics. And Aladdin is one of them. And MSCI has their own toolkit. And Adapar has its toolkit. And on and on and on. And my wife is getting a little cameo in the live <laughs> session here. She's great. I love it. This is the best. This is like radio. This so we really have, is. <laughs> so we have uh, more questions rolling in. Does the technology solution aim for investment outperformance like a hedge fund? Or is Ashby talking about operational efficiencies? Great question, Larry. Um, I am talking about both. So I wrote a nice article for um, Kaya on operational alpha, which goes to this idea that a lot of people kind of start their thinking about institutional investment at that layer of asset allocation. 
and they say, I think it was the Brinson paper that said 93 and a half percent of quarterly performance is a function of, no, the variability in, qu in quarterly performance is a function of asset allocation. That's great. But I can tell you that a hundred percent of your asset allocation is a function of your organizational capabilities. Do you have the people? Do you have the process? Do you have the information in order to manage hedge funds, ETFs, private equity, venture capital? If you want to do 10% more in private equity, you need to invest heavily in your tools to model liquidity because these are commitment-based assets. You make a commitment over four or five years, the GP starts drawing down. If there's a crisis, maybe they draw down faster because they like the prices. These are all things that you really need to be able to model before you set your asset allocation. And so when I say portfolio navigation and GPS and really thinking through um, your portfolio in a data-driven way and plotting it into the future through navigation tools, I'm saying let's get really granular on those projections so that you can hold less cash. That's it. So when you think about personal navigation, we were optimizing for time. When you go and you're like, oh, I'm going to San Francisco. I look at the Google map. It says you got that way. That's 52 minutes. You got that way. That's an hour. Well, I'm going to do the 52 minutes because I don't want to sit in the car for any longer than I have to. The future of what I'm talking about is that we're optimizing for cash holdings. Well, if you model it in this technology, and we're starting to see this with some of the research we're doing, by the way, the really advanced um, technolo technologized investors, to use a term from a book I wrote, um, they hold less cash, 1.1% less cash. In fact, what they use that cash for is to make more contributions to alternative assets. So back to Larry's question, Yes and yes. This is about operational alpha, empowering different asset allocations, delivering higher performance vis-a-vis -vis your peer group. Let's call that alpha. So in that regard, you know, what kinds of new internal investment staff capabilities will be, won't be necessary in integrating these new data and technology processes? Let's start with the board. Because the board of directors may not be like the, you know, the sexiest part of the pension fund world, but it really is the part that um, allocates all the resources. So if you're thinking about building tech in-house or you want a really sophisticated technologist on staff, dare I say a chief technology officer, you start with the board. You got to write up a job spec. You got to get it approved. In some cases, you got to take it to a state legislature. If you were an Alaska permanent fund, that's where you would end up. You'd have to be trying to convince legislators that you need this role. Um, and so ultimately, what I often say is, does the board have this skill or is there a skill gap there? In my experience, I haven't seen many boards of directors with real technologists. I've seen a lot of boards that have expertise, but that expertise is really about finance, investing, auditing, diligence, et cetera. It isn't somebody who's built a decision support analytical toolkit that is now sitting on a board and can really help that board and the management team understand how you build, buy, use, maintain technology. So I think the first thing is to go back up to the board and say, technology is important. We need this skill on the board. And there's often skill gap analyses that get done at the board level. And I think we just need to add technology and data as one of those required skill sets for every one of these organizations. I'm going to pivot and ask you um, Do it. A, a macro macro question. Should public DB plans have a joint role of executive director and CIO, or is that too much for one person and should always be split into separate roles? What would be a best practice? Best practice would be to split it because you, you need, I mean, you generally want dual reporting lines. Um, you, you want maybe like a chief risk officer jumping their reporting into the CEO or maybe having dual into a CIO, CEO. So this is the, but this is the fun part where it's like, okay, there's a recipe, but like really delivering something delicious means tweaking the recipe to meet your unique needs. Every organization is different. 
And sometimes when you combine those two roles, especially for an individual that has the trust of the board, these organizations can move faster. So I don't know if you've noticed this, Jen, but pension funds aren't always the fastest to move when it comes to facilitating co-invest or choosing a new manager or frankly, paying for technology. And so I acknowledge that, well, the best practice governance would say you should split that up. You really have to understand the context of these organizations. No two pension funds are the same. Their capital is different. Their governance is different. Their location is different. And so understanding what's there, you know, two cases where I think it's done incredibly well, where they're shared, BCI, Gordon Fife is both the CIO and the CEO, and Jagdeep Bashir at University of California. The CIO is the CEO of that organization. And I think both are incredibly dynamic and sophisticated, and they are public entities. So it goes both ways. So we are past our half hour LinkedIn oh my gosh. live. But we're gonna we're we're actually going to take a little bit uh, time to answer these questions. Um, we have more rolling in. Uh, everything you have talked about is regarding quantitative portfolio analytics, BlackRock, MSCI, Nasdaq. Mm -hmm. How about technologies centered around qualitative activities? Ooh. How important is this layer? The most important. Golly, Mr. Ken Akundi, my friend. <laughs> um, good to hear from you. And uh, look, I, it's incredibly important. You know, here's the, it's almost, people are going to think I planted that. I did not plant that question. But most of my research ends up being qualitative and case-based because the data is so private. If you want to learn about sovereign funds, like truly learn how sovereign funds make decisions, you have to get on an airplane and go talk to them because the data doesn't get published. So I am hugely um, sympathetic to this idea that we need tools to manage qualitative research. And we need to acknowledge that even in the public space, and I might get this data point wrong, and my friend Jason Voss will be mad at me for that, but you have to know that it's like 92% of the reporting in public finance, sorry, public stock reporting is text. Only 7 or 8% is data. So that is a whole bunch of written stuff that is going to come across as qualitative. And you need to be able to read that and you need to be able to assess it. And so ultimately, I think we need to be very good at managing our networks. I think the whole CRM space really hasn't found its unlock in finance. The CRM space, which is like the Salesforce stuff, um, ultimately like feels like it's for GPs selling fund commitments to LPs. If you're an LP that just wants to like manage their network and, and think about who they're going to turn to for certain deals or advice, the toolkit is pretty bad still, but it's going to get good. You know, if you think about, you know, social networking, it should be like a technology that we figured out given what's happened over the last 15 years. But the shock here, Jen, most of the big pension funds I know, people still manage their networks in Google Docs. They still are afraid to like use the organization CRM because it's their network. Mm -hmm. It's their origination. It's their sourcing. It's their value add. And so we need to sort through all of those qualitative aspects, but it's, it's going to happen. This isn't putting a helicopter on Mars, right? This is like technology that exists. It's not a question of if, but when. I think so. Yes. So um, lastly, we would love to hear about your new course that you were oh, yes. on, in, on, on institutional investing. Let's talk a little bit about your new class and how that came to be. Well, first off, I think that most people on the planet don't know what a pension fund is. I'm pretty sure that's right because I continually ask classes um, who in this class is willing to give a definition of what a pension fund is. Very rarely do I get anybody confident enough to raise their hand. And, and so I started to realize that like, I think these organizations are the most important on earth. And I put a period against that sentence. Remember um, period. 
Like this is 120 trillion. They put the capital in capitalism. They're the foundation of the modern social welfare state. These organizations are critical. We should have entire schools designed to studying them. But most people will actually barely know they exist. Barely. I think you can get a PhD from Stanford, from Oxford, and not have like an obligation to do a section on why do sponsors set up pension plans? Why do they accumulate their returns tax free? This is crazy. And so what I've been like lobbying around Stanford and really around the world is like we need a much bigger focus from the next generation on these organizations. We need to help them achieve their objectives. We need to understand that they aren't pure businesses. They might, you know, they're not pure government. They're this hybrid. And so I wrote a course called Institutional Investors and in Sustainable Capitalism. Um, I was convinced to put sustainable capitalism there because people thought that just institutional investors was too boring, which made me a little fussy, but I did it. And the class is massively oversubscribed already. We were going to do as an experiment with 20 people. We're now over 50 people in the class. I've had to increase registration three times. And um, ultimately, the goal here is to do really three things. One, just explain like why sponsors want to set up entities that are seeking to deliver high commercial financial returns. Call it in. I love the term in Australia where they call it profit for member. It's not a not for profit because they're seeking profit, but mm -hmm. they're seeking profit for this constituency. And so that's the first thing I'm going to do is explain that. Then we're going to explain how they invest and why they invest. And then this, the third part is what the implications are for the world, specifically around the investment capability. Um, there's a lot of other people that spend an amazing amount of time thinking about how pension funds solve government problems or sovereign funds solve you know, problems for central banks or ministries of finance. What I want to do is think deeply about how this ecosystem plugs into that capitalist side of the equation and start training students and getting them excited and ideally, you know, get a generation of Stanford undergrads that want to go work at pension funds. Why not? Absolutely. Right. Yeah, absolutely. When does this class take place? I'd like to join. You want to come at it? <laughs> sure. You're invited. Although I, I, I told you I was going to ask our communications people if we're allowed to do that. But look, I'll sneak you in. Um, it starts April 6th, our first class. This is the first, I think, prove me wrong. I think this is the first class of its kind in America. Where I believe we, it is. I we are going to just, this isn't about manager selection. Maybe we'll talk about that, but that's not, the other classes that I've found out there, it's like, hey, learn how to select a manager and how to manage that process. Or you can take a finance class, which includes portfolio construction. And yes, like we're going to touch on that. But this is much more about like what, where did this 120 trillion come from? And what are the objectives? And if you want to reroute that 120 trillion to solve problems for climate change or solve whatever problem you want, how do you think about doing that? There's a lot of politicians that are like, hmm, that 120 trillion looks pretty interesting for my infrastructure. But like nobody's taking classes on like how you actually leverage it. Hopefully this is class number one and 10 years from now I'll come on and Stanford will have established a new school for beneficial investment organizations. Maybe even before then, Ash Ashby. We can all, we can all hope. I feel tired <laughs> just telling you about it. But yeah. Well, we'll end it right there. Ashby, thank you so much for an illuminating and terrific conversation. Thank you to our audience. We will see you soon, Ashby. Uh, I plan to take a trip out there. Come uh, see me. Yes, I will. And congratulations to your nephew, the new shortstop for the New York Yankees. Couldn't let it go. I'm sorry. And Very exciting. Very yes. exciting. Yes. Anthony Volpe. Thank you so much, <laughs> Ashby. Thank right. everyone. See you soon. Bye.